I'm Vinny Politan. Thanks so much for joining us here on Closing Arguments. And guess what? All day long today on Court TV, a brand new live trial. Our gavel to gavel coverage uh, will continue. And it's all taking place out in Wisconsin. It's a case in involving a woman who disappeared in 2013. And the question is, where is she? Was she murdered? Um, did she just take off? Did she take her own life? Those are the issues that are, are surrounding this case as prosecutors try to prove a case without a body. So what evidence do they have? What witnesses do they have? How can they prove this? It's going to be a challenge. I mean, it's always a challenge as a prosecutor because you've got to prove the case uh, beyond any and all reasonable doubt. But here, you don't even have the victim's body. So where do you go? And, and I think where prosecutors are going in this case is painting the picture of what was happening inside the lives of this husband and wife and what the husband was doing. But on the other side, the defense may point at what was going on in Victoria Prokopovic's life and how she had battled depression. And is it reasonable to think that maybe something other than a murder took place here? The bottom line is she has never been found, and this is so tragic for her family. And her daughter, Stacy Deer, one of the first witnesses in the case, testifying about her mom. And her testimony, extremely honest. And, it, and, it's, and that's what witnesses should do, is tell the truth, always tell the truth. But, but you can understand how difficult it is when your mom's missing and, and you know, you're trying to figure out what happened here and who is responsible and what the answer to this all is. But she got on the stand, testified, testified about her mother, and some of what she said may help prosecutors, but it may also help the defense. Take a look. Through the years and as you were growing up, um, um, did you spend time with your mom uh, doing different things through the years? Yes. Um, what were some of the things that you liked to do with your mom? We would do crafting together. We would go to Brahmid sales. Um, we liked to shop. She liked to be part of our lives. She'd hang with us and our friends. Okay. Um, we'd go driving. And when you're talking about through the years as you're growing up and spending time with your mom, um, were there uh, good days and days that weren't so good with your mom? Yes. Uh, did your mom suffer from some depression issues? Yes. And that was something that you all kind of understood? Correct. Um, were those things that even affected how much contact you were having with her at times? Yes. And at that time, was there a, a statement made that was somewhat disturbing to you? Yes. Okay. She had You're stated, the person she said that to. What did she say? She had stated that no one would find her next time. Okay. And when she said that to you, okay, let's, let's date that, 2003, mm -hmm. when she said that to you, did you ask her about that? No. At any point, did she ever, at some point after that incident, talk to you about the fact she didn't mean that statement? Yes, she did. Okay. So what, what was the context of that? When did that happen? When I had confronted her, well, I didn't confront her, when I had talked to her about a coworker of mine being in the hospital for attempting suicide, and then she had gotten home and she had succeeded. And I had called mom, and I was, and I remember specifically, I was standing in Target, and I had said, Mom, look, it's so bad that you feel this is your only way out. And she said, it just, it's a feeling that no one can ever know unless they've been there. It's something you can't describe. And she said, and you feel that's your only option and then she did tell me, she goes, I say that, but I really don't mean it. Were there ever times that um, your mother was also, um, 
Or did, did your mother ever share with you anything that troubled her in her marriage with Jim? Or didn't she? She, she didn't say too much, a lot to us kids. But that one time I went out there, she said he was a little overbearing where he wouldn't let her do her own thing. Okay. Well, and do you know who handled the bills in their relationship? He did. And therefore, um, did he handle the money? Yes. Um, did you ever see that that would affect the decisions your mom would make with being able to buy things? Yes. Um, did you ever hear anything about Jim gambling? He gambled a lot, yeah. Okay. It's difficult, very emotional. She's talking about her mom, and, her, and she doesn't know what happened. I mean, her mom has never been found. Uh, let's bring in Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter, who's joining us from Green Bay, Wisconsin tonight. Chanley, uh, great to see you. And, and, folks, she's not outside. I know it's like minus whatever there. She's uh, in our mobile studio. Um, Chanley... Tell us a little bit more about Stacy Deer, and, and, and the defendant is not her father, right? No, he is her stepfather. Her mother, Victoria, and Jim met when she was 10 years old. So he was a big part of her life for 24 years as her stepfather. And she was a huge witness today, Minnie. The star witness of day one of the trial certainly is Stacy Deer because, like you said earlier, her honesty, her authenticity really comes across on the witness stand. And you could tell that she was wanting to get her story out there. Your heart goes out to her because it's been eight years. And she... Her mother has been missing, and she does believe that her stepfather has something to do with it. You could clearly tell by her testimony. But she was able to really walk this jury and give them context, not only to her mother, but the, to the relationship she had with her stepfather. The defendant, the jury is seeing, sitting there all day long inside the courtroom. But she also talks about some of the past suicide attempts of her mother, which again can cut both ways, right? Because the defense in opening statements is saying that Victoria committed suicide in 2013. And so her daughter was honest in saying that yes, there are at least two confirmed attempts that she attempted to take her life. There was a third one, but her mother said that it was accidental. It was an accidental overdose. The prosecution was able to bring out that each of those times in the past that her mother Victoria would leave a note they she would leave a note and she would attempt it in a place where they could find her so there was all kinds of unusual circumstances around what happened in 2013 that just didn't add up to her it didn't fit the mo if you will of what her mother had done in the past and she was able to really outline that for the jury in that her mother just would not disappear without a trace and we say without a trace, uh, was, did she have a car, a phone, things like that? What sort of details uh, do we know at this point uh, surrounding her disappearance? Yeah, so uh, Stacy was able to tell the jury that there's no way her mother would have left anywhere, even the next room, without her pack of cigarettes. And the authorities show up to the home that day, and her purse is there, her cigarettes are left there, her cell phone is left there. They even look outside the home. We heard from a couple of law enforcement um, officers who were there that day, and they talk about the ground being sort of soft, where it would leave impressions. There weren't any footprint impressions around the house. There was no evidence whatsoever that something had happened and it was very suspicious. They also talk about the behavior of the defendant when Victoria went missing and Stacy said that she grew suspicious in how her stepfather was seemed uninterested in finding her mother and didn't help the search parties go out and look for the mother and didn't really tell the authorities or encourage the authorities to look for her mother. And she said that was all very suspicious. And then she learned about three months after her mother disappeared that her father, her stepfather says he was in a relationship with someone named Kathy Friday. And that really was uh, put her over the top in thinking that this was something uh, really bad happened to her mother. Now, um, today also opening statements in the case, and the, the big issue, again, is for prosecutors trying to uh, prove a case where the, the victim's body has not been recovered, has not been found. So let's listen to a little bit of what the prosecutor says he can prove. You'll hear 
during the course of an interview with law enforcement, the defendant uh, admitted to being involved in Vicki's disappearance. Quote, okay, I'll tell you, okay, I'll admit I killed her. I killed her, there, I killed her. For retracting that comment a few moments later. You'll also hear, however, the defendant spoke with other individuals while in custody. Regarding this case, you'll hear what he was telling those inmates, that he was 100% sure that they would never find Vicki. Quote, where is she at? Is she missing? The defendant replying, no, she's dead. The other inmate asking, well, how do you know she's dead? The defendant replying, oh, believe me, I know. Okay, this sounds like a confession. Do we know if it's on video, audio recording, or is it just according to the notes of the investigators who are interviewing him? I'm not sure yet until it's introduced into evidence, but we know that this was a huge part of the prosecution's opening because they're going to use the defendant's own words against him to really show not only his contradicting stories, but at one point he said, okay, yes, I killed her. And also bringing in confidential or cooperating informants from the jail where he was being held. With statements that he made to other inmates, including one where he actually says that he knew for sure that Vicki was dead. And the inmate says, well, how do you know? And he says, well, she committed suicide, but I got rid of the body. And I know for sure she's dead. And not only the statements to the inmates, Vinny, but also statements to friends and family who were helping search and look for Vicki when it happened. And he said, oh, you're wasting your time. You're not going to find her. She's gone. She's dead. Those type of statements that really set off the red flags for those who were sincerely trying to look for her. So a big part of the circumstantial case for the prosecution includes the defendant's own words. And again, this was eight years later almost, and he gave several statements and interviews to the authorities over the years. So that will be part of the prosecution to introduce all of those statements that he made. Yeah, inconsistent, but at some point saying, yeah, I killed her. I mean, that's that's huge uh, for prosecutors. And the statement to the, to the other inmate that she um, took her own life, but I got rid of the body, that's like framing yourself for murder. I mean, that's kind of strange. All right, let's listen to what the defense had to say, because they have an opportunity as well in their opening statement. What the state has not told you is Victoria Prokopovitz has suffered from mental health issues since a teenager. She's been seeing a counselor since 1971. She was 18 years old. And she's struggled with her mental health since that time. Since that time, she had been diagnosed with multiple personalities, where she had several different individuals. She was diagnosed with depression anxiety, and there were suicide attempts. The state wants you to believe that my client murdered his wife because he wanted to get in a relationship with another woman. It's not true. The state wants you to believe that my client, at 68 years old, perfectly executed his wife's murder to the point that nobody can find her. You're not going to hear how it happened. You're not going to know when it happened. You're not going to have proof of a body. And everything he's saying is true, uh, that you're not going to have some of that evidence that we get in most of these cases. You're not going to have evidence of a murder, a body. There's no physical evidence. There's no direct evidence. In fact, the, one of the arguments the defense attorney made was, look, this is a 68-year-old man at the time that his wife goes missing. And you expect him to commit the perfect murder and the, where a body is never found. You also expect the 68-year-old man at the time to murder his wife and the house is in perfect order. 
uh, that morning when, when the authorities are there. So some interesting, strong arguments in, in tone from the defense, and you could even echo it on the cross-examinations uh, today for all of the witnesses as well. Absolutely. Not going to be an easy case uh, for prosecutors here. Um, what's coming up tomorrow, Chanley? So tomorrow we're expecting more law enforcement officers to take the stand to testify, but another a daughter of Victoria will take the stand, someone that has been in the news all over the years, keeping her mother's story out there, Marsha Loritz. She was in the gallery early first thing this morning and then had to leave because of the rule of sequestration. She had to leave uh, the courtroom and can't watch it. We're expecting to hear more emotional testimony from those who knew Victoria the best. All right, Chanley Painter live in Green Bay, Wisconsin tomorrow. And again, our coverage continues uh, tomorrow morning. Thanks so much, Chanley. Yeah, thanks, Vinny.